Okay. All right. I don't know what that was about, but it's all fixed now. So, um, right. and let's see, we're all here. Um, so this is a meeting of the library building committee design subcommittee and the design subcommittee members that are here are Jeff Quackenbush, Stephen Dalmas, and myself. Um, and uh, Andrea Bono Bunker for the MBLC. Um, so, okay. Um, so we have minutes to discuss. Um, and so Lauren sent me one correction, just um, uh, she just changed the wording a little bit about the um, circulation desk. She wants it to be a furniture and not millwork, and she wants it to be uh, modular so that it can be moved around. Um, and so I, and she would just change the wording a little bit in the minutes. And Stephen and I are having a, um, Jeff, you weren't at the meeting, um, so you won't get to vote you'll on the minutes anyway, but Stephen and I had a disagreement um, about one section. Um, and, um, and so, so we need to iron that out. Um, so That's Stephen, what? Well, my first question is, uh, did you, uh, the other items that I noted? All of those I agreed with. Okay, so yeah. if you go down to the plan in the notes, and then you see shelving. Uh-huh. And then you go down to children. Yeah. And then the line that starts, the current plan is five high around the perimeter and three high for the mobile units. Dropping the wall shelving to four high decreases the, and then there's nothing. And I think what that should then say is dropping that to four high decreases the total linear feet below the target by 72 linear feet. Okay. Okay. So, um, Let's see. Um, I have to pull up. So, so I, so I agree that there needs to be something, um, but I, I don't think it's seventy-two linear feet. I think the seventy-two linear feet was if we decrease the shelving in the teen room from four shelves to three shelves, and it was seventy-two square linear feet there. And so I thought that, um, you know, Matt and Dominic and Porpla could give us the correct numbers. Um, that's well, why I left it for today. Well, if you look back up where it has current linear feet of shelving. Right. And you look at children, it shows 476 linear feet. Uh, and then that's target. And the current is 482 linear feet. And then parentheses, 404 with four high shelves. So that's where I got the 72. Oh, that's feet. where you got the 72. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay, then I'm, so now I see where you got the 72 and this was just something that we couldn't discuss over email. So I'll go ahead and I'll make that correction. Now I see where you got it. Okay. Um, okay, good. Um, I didn't make it up. Okay, no, good. I just, I just wanted to, um, I, you know, it just, it started to feel like we were deliberating and I said, right, okay, right. if we're going to deliberate, we need to deliberate in a public meeting. Um, so now I see where you got it, and I'm I'm happy to make that correction. And then Stephen's other corrections were um, were more about grammar and extra words popped in here and there, and I made those. They were small corrections. So, so uh, is there any other discussion about the minutes? No, I just have one question. Isn't Molly now part of the design subcommittee? No. No, oh, she's just sitting in. Okay. Yeah. All right. So is there a motion to um, accept the I minutes as amended? Motion. I make the motion. We accept you make the, the motion as amended. Um, I guess I'll second it. Um, okay. And then we can vote. So Stephen, how Aye. do you vote? Okay. Aye. Uh, Jeff? Abstain. Okay. And I'll vote aye. And so those minutes pass as amended. Okay. 
All right, terrific. Okay, I think that was our um, our business for the day. And then, um, uh, and so then I'm gonna hand it off to Dominic and Matt. Right. And Orpla, okay. All right, so um, thanks a lot, Marianne. So um, over the past few weeks, we've been busy meeting with our consultants to continue the design development efforts and, and coordination. Um, so uh, we will go through um, a few plan refinements that we've been working on. And are you able to see that or not? Yes. With the plan underlay? It looks just like the plan didn't show up, Dominic. Yeah, I'm just going to reopen. Um, hang on a second. <clears throat> okay, here we go. All right, let me reshare. Oops, my apologies, wrong button. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Right. Excellent. Apologies. I think I just broke connection to the server there for a second. Um, so we'd like to go over a few different things, a number of, the, uh, you know, a few little things on the plan. Also some coordination efforts with our consultants um, further in the presentation. So um, and then there were some um, items that we wanted to discuss with you, the owner, about um, getting a few things coordinated as well. So starting off with the plans. Um, uh, there was a request, uh, Marianne, to remove a door to the electrical room um, so that you do not do, uh, enter directly from the meeting room into the electrical room. We've reviewed this with our um, mechanical engineers and were able to locate a door between storage and electrical. Um, it's, it's confined space, but it does work here with storage um, uh Items. So what we have here is uh, five uh, tables that can be folded and stored. And then we have three chair dollies um, that would be able to store all your chairs. Um, the electrical room would not need to be accessed regularly under lock and key. Um, the We were hoping to not have a door there. Um, the electrical engineer is requesting that we have an outswinging door. To that room so um they need as much of that sm space we've given them you know a, a minimal amount of space and they need that door to be out swing um so i just wanted to give you that uh information we've got a blow up plan of that we'll also have a look at the staff workroom circulation desk and then the children cubby bench we wanted to give you a 3d view of that so that you can um uh, get a sense of that as well. So, um, Marion, is that storage room really big enough? I mean, you just no. lost, you just lost almost ten square feet. I I agree. I agree, Jeff. So so that came up last week, where um, or two weeks ago, when someone else raised a question. There are three doors along that wall, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it you know it means that we don't have as much wall space as might be nice to have because mm -hmm. the walls break it up and so um so anyway i i think that the storage space is more important than um than the wall space okay. um so and I, I i do appreciate the investigation um and and I hear the concern about the wall space, but I think storage mm -hmm. space in a library that already has minimal storage space is mm -hmm. more important. Yeah, um, that sounds good. So we can go back to the yeah. previous layout. Um, you know, the one consideration is, do we have an art ra track or rail to be able to hang artwork? Um, and, you know, this configuration would allow you to have a little more space there. Right. Um, but you do have that space on this side, so and that can right. be utilized as such. And, and you there, will have a little bit of space there as well. And there'll be space in between the doors for small That's right. That's artwork. Right. That's right. Um, 
and oh, and we we're you know we're we're not going to be able to do everything so Stephen right. and penny have their hands up yeah um two two questions um could you um have the storage room door hinged on the other side and then uh, have the electrical room have a pocket door, which would be on the wall right where the uh, current storage room door hits. Mm. Yep. And then the second thing, I, I uh, this goes along with you know Penny's concern, which I agree with. Could we have uh, a say sliding door, if you will, that uh, goes in front of the book drop storage door so you could display art on there and then or whatever and then when you needed to get in the book storage it just slides over to partially cover the kitchen but then you can slide it back mm, that's a good idea so um i investigated pocket doors and so for the electrical room it's actually a one hour rated room and oh. so we wouldn't meet that rating with a pocket door so um that wouldn't work for the electrical room i think and we have to study this further whether we could enclose the kitchenette um with some sort of system potentially giving you you know at least closing that off and maybe there's a way that we could coordinate some sort of you know additional wall space therein um and you know as you say Stephen, you know having a sliding door that does dual duty the the book drop is also a rated room so because you have a return slot there's a code requirement to make the book drop room also fire rated um just for safety reasons in case you know something gets put into the book drop room that shouldn't be um so sliding door across the book drop would also not work well my my uh uh uh, intent is not to eliminate that fire rated door, but to Got actually it. have a secondary, Got essentially it. a panel that could be used for display that can slide. Yep. And I also, in, in my thoughts, considered, you know, could you have something in front of the kitchen? The problem is, hmm. uh, let's say you're having a, uh, a art opening and you need hmm. to use the kitchen and you've got art on the door that's going to be in front of the kitchen. So is that sliding over an area where there's some art? Um, so that's why I was moving to having mm -hmm. a panel in front of the books drop storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice idea. We can definitely investigate that. We'll have a look. I'm what not sure, question? Matt, if you if you know more about you know double um, egress you know doors across. Um, I, don't, I don't think it would be an egress issue because, yeah. well, I, I actually don't know. We should check. I yeah. mean, I suppose theoretically somebody could go into that room and, and get locked in or and get blocked in. Right. I, I think it's unlikely. I will say that's a room that people, that staff are going to be accessing multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that gets used just occasionally. It could be. You know, I could see that, you know, it it wouldn't be unusual to think that that wouldn't be that a staff person wouldn't go in and out of there, mm -hmm. um, you know, 10 times a day. Um, but the, the other thing, Dominic, that we'll have to talk to our code consultant about if that door to the electric room truly needs to be an out swinging door. Mm -hmm. When we had it on the on the meeting room side wall it was an in-swinging door. If it swings yeah. out, let's say we wanted to put it here, yeah. that's blocking our meeting that's right. doors, which doesn't doesn't work. Correct. So, I think it has to go here. If we were to put it here, I, I'm it's, not sure that, that that would be allowable, you know, given this kind of egress path that we're setting up. Hmm. So we'll have to, we'll have to talk with Corey mm -hmm. about that. Yep. Um, okay. one, one question I have, we haven't talked about AB yet, um, but Marianne, are you anticipating that we'll have a projection screen or a wall mounted video monitor? Because it, it implicates this wall in terms of its ability to, to display art at times when you're not having a presentation. And if it was a, 
if it was a projection screen, the screen theoretically could be mounted in a way that it's, you know, the screen is rolling down in front of artwork so you don't have to move artwork that's hanging on that wall. But if it's a video monitor, then it's always there. Right, right. And I think um, we probably don't have to make that decision today. And 10 years ago, I would have said it was a projection screen, right? But yeah. now um, I think it might be a giant monitor, like mm -hmm. the one in the basement of Town Hall. Yeah. Interactive, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and and that does mean that we do lose that space um, for, um, uh, you know, for art display. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Matt, okay. to your to your earlier point about the electric room, I believe the in swing out swing is a function of how much voltage is in the electric room. I think if it's above a certain threshold by electrical code, it has to be an out swing door. I don't know what the limit is. Um, yeah. I'd and be I'd... surprised if we're triggering that here, though, given the size of the building. My guess is they want it out swinging because they want to preserve wall space inside. That was the conversation I had with him. Yeah, it was about wall okay. space. Yeah. I was going to say the other thing, too, is usually it has to have panic hardware on it mm. in case someone is um, flashed from the electric panel and can't see. They need a emergency device to get out. So. Mm -hmm. okay. um penny did you have an outstanding question your hand's still up um, i do is there any way the electric access could be from the exterior of the building it's a good question i i don't remember matt um i'd be happy to entertain that Actually. Yeah, we talked about this, Dominic, a few weeks ago, whether or not we could do that. For, I haven't ever seen that be the case. Uh, exterior access is usually for something like the fire pump room, where the fire department needs to get in there without going through the building. Um, I don't, <clears throat> I mean, I don't see why you couldn't do that for hmm. the electrical room, but I, we should check with TMP and with Code Red to see mm -hmm. what they're But that, that would solve a bunch of problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. We are considering just to let everybody know that um, the roll-up generator access panel um, has to be um, mounted to the exterior of the building. And we're considering this location here. We, we've already started those discussions with the electrical engineer. Um, but oh. that would be great to coordinate a door and that panel potentially on this wall if they fit. I don't think those hookups are that big though. no they're not it's it's yeah. like a small residential kind of exterior yeah. electrical so then there might be panel. room on that wall to to be able to accommodate both it i guess yeah. it's part of it is a question of what's happening inside and what happens behind that panel but we we can review it with our consultants and see if that's a possibility if it is it preserves some wall space for us it preserves storage room square footage yep uh doesn't complicate egress so it would be i think probably a, a good option for us yep um andrea i'm not sure who was first i'm sorry andrea i see your hands up and i'll get to you Stephen. too thank you so i just want to reiterate what marianne said about the book drop storage room and how that would impede workflow efficiency um, if you had another door on top of that. And that's one of the things that our goal is to have as most as inefficient building as we can. Mm -hmm. um, with the electrical room, the BMS, I'm assuming it's going to be a BMS system, right? So you're going to have a building management system. Where is that going to be located? Are you going to have the system on a computer in the circulation workroom or will it be in the electrical area. I think that's important to consider before you decide to do an exterior door because mm -hmm. staff shouldn't have to walk outside to go mm -hmm. back into a room 
to deal with any issues that they might be finding. And and even though we would like um, this not to be the case, most libraries have to tinker with their lighting, their Mm -hmm. everything on the BMS um, after opening. It's a, it can take up some time. Marianne, if you talked to Patrick and Hadley, that's one of the things we talked about at his post-occupancy. So I would just hate for something to be located in a way that it's inefficient for staff to be able to access it. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, Andrea. My understanding um, in talking to our electrical engineers is that um, we're going to have a very simplistic BMS system. So I don't know that it'll even consist of a standalone computer, but there will be some sort of panel. And I think it is planned to be in the electrical room. So um, duly noted, you know, potentially an exterior door doesn't work or we relocate that panel. Um, With regards to lighting, I think we're going with a local control system. But again, we're going to schedule a meeting with our mechanical engineers for them to present kind of a holistic building controls um, presentation for you. So um, we can kind of cover all those um, scenarios, but it's a good point. Um, potentially, we the, this exterior door doesn't work in that um, case. Um, I don't know how much space we would have um, if we look at the staff workroom. I know we're going to quickly jump to that as well. Oh, I went the wrong way. Um, just don't want to double up my... I think I just hit this twice yeah so we have a telecom closet potentially that could be used um so i'll coordinate with them um uh, with electrical and see if that works thanks for bringing that up yeah um steven um am i correct that the storage room doesn't need a fire rated door that's correct what if you did a pocket door for the storage room which would then allow you to slide that electrical room door up into kind of where the current entry area is into the storage room. Yep. So pocket door here, right. and then this door could slide up here. Right. Um, it's not optimal with opening doors into passages. Um, I can review with code. Um, Matt, I don't know what your sense is of that um, off the top of memory. Yeah, I, I mean, we can look at that. I. I think it would have to pocket though into the electric room wall. So yeah. we would need to make sure that we could, with a pocket, we could still achieve the one hour rating there. Yeah, it's true. Um, but I mean, we could, we could explore that. Yeah. I mean, to, to me, this is going to go back and say that, I, you know, we just want to be able to use the, the library has very limited storage and, um, and I think that, you know, it's, it, there are going to be times when somebody just needs to take a box and open that storage room door and slide the box in. And, um, and, and I, I just want to be able to protect this library staff of the future from, you know, not having to worry about if they're blocking access to the electrical room by using the storage closet. Mm-hmm. Um, to confirm the way the storage room is laid out right now. So we have five large tables that we commonly spec. Well, the tables commonly seat 10. Um, and so having 50 seats, we have five tables um, for an arrangement for the meeting room. And then we have the three chair dollies, um, each with a capacity to hold more than 20, but it gets a bit unmanageable if there's more than 20 on a car. So we like to spec about 20 per cart um so hence the third cart would only have 10 chairs on it but potentially you purchase more if you're holding a meeting with spill out into the lobby so you could maybe you know purchase 60 chairs and store them there um but you can see there in the storage room it all the mo- half of the square footage is taken up just storing the um, furniture yeah um andrea I was just going to mention, and I know this is probably on everyone's mind too when talking about the storage room, but there's going to be a lot more materials that need to be stored in there for programming, for um, events, that sort of thing. I'm assuming, Marianne, that you're going to need that wall shelving and that space for 
all of those materials um, because they won't fit behind in the workroom or in the circulation area. So. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, Andrea, to that point and Marianne, whether I look into um, a little more about the, the spec on the dolly and how many um, chairs it can handle. And is that manageable for you? Can we consolidate to two dollies? Because I think it's, it would be great if we could. And we commonly limit to 20, but let me investigate that because I think having an extra, um, you know, that extra space is going to be critical for you as well. Um, um, Dominic, is that you, Matt? Yeah, I just, yep. I'm just thinking about this and wondering if we flip the door to open against the kitchen, mm -hmm. it kind of frees up that left-hand wall and then we could yep. incorporate wall shelving, you know, full height wall shelving on that wall, maybe even turn the corner. Yep. Maybe you just have it on the wall, but and we reserve the space between it and that first dolly. Mm -hmm. But just you know, to Andrea's point, trying to maximize the storage in there, figure out the, mm -hmm. the most efficient way to lay that out so we're mm -hmm. we're utilizing every square foot. I think yep. I was looking at this layout, Matt, and potentially having an extension wing wall to capture the door swing. Um, kind of, I don't know if you can see my mouse there. Yeah. And then, you know, whether there are options to reconfigure this. Yeah. So I think well. the, so, the wing wall might, well, I don't know. I guess the yeah. door is always, the door is going to be there that you have to work around right. it. I don't know that it, that it is necessary. Not working. Yeah. We'll continue to study the storage room then and maximize storage, um, Marianne. Um, so that's the meeting room. Um, so then I wanted to move to the staff workroom and circulation desk. And there's a few items here that we can, um, cover, um, Mary Ann, I can give you this information and potentially we can take the conversation further offline. Um, so I know that you had initiated a conversation about standing height um sitting height counters for the circulation desk and i know there's a strong um request to make the circulation desk a furniture and off the shelf kind of um ff and e purchase instead of a mill work um uh piece so commonly we in our other projects we like to custom design the circulation desk to really meet your needs um you know you can really customize drawers where's a book return um the amount of staff sitting you know at a circulation desk i know we're pinched for space here as well so we would tend to go that route but i know flexibility then it comes up in question so we have used a um i'll show you some imagery of um an ff &E product a, a circulation desk product in other projects that we could use here i guess my initially a question I have for you about how you program the circulation desk is I, how would you like to um, handle book returns? Most commonly we have a, a generous circulation desk, which has integrated a book return slot and it has a book cart. That's awesome. Um, I think if we go to an FF and E um, scenario, we have to do a bit more of a deep dive in being able to get a circulation desk that is high enough to allow for a book drop cart, a book cart to, to fit underneath. And I guess as we continue this conversation, I just wanted to get a sense from you. Are you open to alternative ways for patrons to drop off books? Um, may, um, maybe okay. like a book cart that is labeled that you know patrons can actually return a book onto a book cart that you could, you know, maybe that's a little bit uh, more efficient um, Andrea, it sounds like you, you have something to add I, here. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify before. I think when Lauren said furniture, she just means mm. something that is a movable piece so that it's not bolted into the ground, like mm -hmm. typical millwork for a circulation desk. So it doesn't have to be a purchase ready item. I see. If that makes sense. So you can still yep. design it, but design it in a way that makes it a piece of furniture. Got it. 
that can be moved. So I just wanted yeah. to add that clarification. Okay. And just while I'm on the counter, that's 24 inches. All of our libraries that have a 24 inch counter are saying that they are not functional for them. Got it. So if we could make any counters 30 inches, that mm -hmm. would be ideal. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Um, thanks for that, Andrea. And I'm glad to hear the clarification on the circ desk. Um, so we can design it basically with kind of feet at the bottom and something that you could just pick up and move. Um, so that helps out a lot. Um, so we want, so just we want a return slot that people slide their books into and it goes into a a book cart. Right. A yep. cart. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So initially Underneath the desk. Yes, great. So we will start there and we'll we'll incorporate that. We may lose we may look at reconfiguring how this desk lays out. Um usually you like to incorporate and I've got some sections that kind of assembly in a higher um you know 40 inch plus um countertop and then kind of the workspace can be um at, at 34, you know, something a bit lower. Um also to mention, um, we're looking at locating a counter, a printer station um, that would sit on a counter condition next to adults and computers. Spatially, I think it works. It really, it, it's a prominent position and really there for patron use. Um, you know, if this feels a bit too prominent or, or if it doesn't need to be in that location, I wonder if we could put it under the desk and maybe patrons have access to a printer functionality in the library, you know, to be able to print, but then come to the circ desk to retrieve it. Um, or that printer gets located in the staff workroom. So um, there's a few options. This was a first take. Often we do have, if we have generous space, we have a, um, a printer station in a library that's readily accessible for patrons. So um, that would be this, this would be that solution, I guess, um, as you see it here. Um, um, another another thing we could consider is just flipping it and, and yep. putting the printer kind of down that's at the end of a, of a count, longer counter with yep. the computer stations here and here, just to yep. kind of take it out. Cause it's not, it's not the best thing to look at. No, agreed. And then, you know, this would right. just have like kind of a low screen, nothing. You'd obviously be be able to see over it when you're seated. Yep. So I think that's a better location already, as you said. That's not a better location for staff, though. Too hard for um, staff. So, um, because we're going to have one printer. We're not going to have more than one printer. And, mm. um, and staff will be using it more than patrons will. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and then a lot of the patrons are going to need help with it. Mm -hmm. um so i would either have it in the staff workroom or in that location okay. okay we'll continue to look at that right um so good to know that we will continue with a millwork piece for circulation desk i think the fact that we are constrained for space every inch will count and that you know if you go with an off-shelf product it's, you, you know, you, I know the one that I will show you further down in the presentation is an eight foot wide and you can't get it wider than that. And this is already nine feet to really maximize, you know, space. So we'll stick with mill work for this. We'll include a book return um, slot and, and we'll go from there. Um, a change as well is that, and I'll show you some elevations to show this. I just want to go over it quickly and plan. So you're um, orientated to these moves. Um, is we have an integrated shelving, um, three high shelves inside um, the staff room, but it is accessible to the circulation desk. So that way you could, um, that would be storage for circulation desk. I'll show you an elevation of that to explain that. Um, and then on the flip side, which is the inside of the staff workroom, then you also have shelving. So it's two times shelving. It's back-to-back -back shelving, basically, under counter. So um, we have a counter here, um, which is 30 deep. This is 24 currently, to Andrea's point. You're going to want this to be 30 deep. Um, and, and then we have the storage closet 
um, which is kind of banked on this solid wall here. Um, before we move away from this plan, um, uh, Marianne, I know that we, you had raised questions about standing, you know, more of a um, bench height for countertops, or you know, the question is, do you sit at a lower desk height for circulation desk, or is it actually more a bar height where you can either stand at or you can have a a, um, a bar height task chair to sit at. Um, so it depends I, who's there and, and what right. the preferences are. I, I was thinking that was more for in the staff work room. Got it. Um, so some people like to stand. It was interesting. Yep. We were just, um, I thought everybody liked to stand at the counter. I like to stand at and mm. work at that height, which mm -hmm. was the higher height. Mm -hmm. And um, and when asked, uh, everybody, meaning what other person, because that's how many we have. We have two. The other person preferred the lower height. So, so it would be good if those counters were different heights. Yeah. So okay. to that point, um, to maximize shelving yeah. in this location to get three high, this would have to be a raised stand-up counter. And I think that would work really well here. So right. potentially this could be your standing, which kind of works well with looking through the glass. And then this could be your seating um, counter, if that works. Um, Andrea, I see you have a comment. Can you make one of those furniture with a sit-stand desk, sit-stand counter? Marianne, how, how would you feel about that? I, so I'm sorry, a truck was going by. A, did you say a sit stand? Sit desk? stand desks. You can either get it so it's powered or manually operated, so you can bring it up or down to whatever height you desire. Um, so I I would like to avoid things like that, just um because I know that Irving's has been problematic, um, uh from the first day. So. So it depends. Um, you mean their circ desk area? Yep. So this is this would be much different than that because that was kind of. I know what you're saying about that. Many libraries have the sit stand desks at their staff stations that are just. It's a desk that gets raised or lowered without any other component having to go up or down with it, unlike the desk in Irving. So. This is a much more simplistic version of that. And you can even get it manual. I'm standing on a manual run one right now. So you yeah. can crank it up and down right. um, depending. So it's uh -huh. one way to have more flexibility if you foresee needing to use that space and look out into the, mm -hmm. the main library mm -hmm. at whatever height you need. Mm -hmm. To that point, Andrea, we could have that as a furniture piece that sits stand desk, but take the place of this counter. And then this could be your millwork, um, you know, at counter at the bar height. So this would be mm -hmm. raised already. And then this could be your furniture item. Or if you want to program this as lower, this could be your standing with shelving underneath. And we could drop this down so that you could have this down at, at a regular desk height. So this could be desk height in the back. This could be desk height. And then it pops up automatically just to be able to house the shelving underneath. So this could be your standing section. That could be your sitting. So a few different options there. Would you be um, using a computer at any of those stations, Marianne? I think we would have one staff computer in that staff workroom. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess preference to have it here for privacy. So mm -hmm. then... Um, but again, you could do, like Andrea said, maybe we do that as a furniture piece and that gives you the flexibility. And whoever's at that desk, they can then alter it. If we do that counter where the shelving is as a higher counter, we could fit three shelves in there rather than two, which I think would be preferable. Probably That's right. Both yeah. Sides. Yeah. So here are the elevations for that. So just orientating you around um, the page. Um, this one in the bottom right corner is the view from the circulation desk looking back at the staff workroom. So you have the two book storage book carts to the right here. And then you have three bookshelves that are housed underneath um, the window. 
and then moving up, you have two interior elevations of the staff workroom, east and west. So the east one here is looking out to the circulation space beyond. So currently drawn, we have the three bookshelves with standing um, counter height continuous, but we could take this out here and make this furniture, or we could drop this down. And then looking at the west elevation, so looking out into um, uh, exterior window here to the right, we have the storage closets, and then we have this counter, you know, this work surface, which can be high um, up or down, however you would like to. And can the shelves be adjustable? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. yep. Um, all right. And then the circulation desk has two book trucks underneath and shelves. Yep. Okay. And is there the library of things supposed to be we, in that glass we area? Talked about that. We haven't, um, we haven't shown that yet, although Dominic, this came up in our last meeting. Yeah, I talked to Poplar about it. Yeah. And we're very generous for reception and browsing. Um, and again, after hours access to this shelving unit is also a question. Um, but do we kind of divide these shelves? So we kind of program what is... Um, reception brow you know what is the browsing element and then what is the library of things potentially or is that a little bit too removed i can understand that you may not want patron direct access that it's something that they have to ask for well, behind so camera. with the circulation desk um sorry there goes the truck um there are two are those book trucks behind the circulation desk yep yeah um so, um, okay. Um, I would say there only needs to be one book truck. Are those, you know, like nice. three foot long? Correct. Double-sided. Yeah. Uh, Double-sided. Yeah. yeah. I think there only needs to be one of those. Um, would you like um, us to extend then? Uh, so we're looking at this elevation here. So we could remove this storage cart and bring the shelving across. The thing is, it then implicates your countertop. So we can have a look at that. Maybe there's a, a best of both worlds. Um, I'm trying to get back long way. So you can see here this counter, the width here, right? If we right. take this book card out and then incorporate additional shelving. Um, I think we could still manage a single person stand, you know, um, sit stand desk. Um, I think they're about 40 inches wide. You can get different spec, but you know, um that that may still work here and and give you a little bit more breathing room for this single cart. Back back to the library of things question. I know we had talked last time about it kind of living here behind the glass or in front of the glass, but somehow sort of integrated into the glass between the staff workroom and the circulation desk. Putting it here means that you lose that as a work surface, and it and and I don't think we can really afford to have it go all the way across because then you have no work surface along that whole wall. So to Dominic's point, you know, and and the fact that we have all of this space available to us, I wonder if there's a way to incorporate it here and then try to find a solution to the after hours um, security question by. And, and I've seen these in retail applications where there's display shelving for merchandise, and then there's a kind of concealed roller screen that comes down in front of it that's sort of lockable. So effectively closing off that display area. We've got room and a soffit above to hide something like that that could roll down and, and potentially close that off. So we could look into that as a possibility for securing that whole section or or half of that depending on you know how we're uh how we're using that shelving um, but i didn't marianne i guess the question is how accessible should the library of things be i that... think the library of things in that location works um 
you know, it's it's a collection that doesn't really exist yet. Um, but um, uh, it, but um, uh, but I do I do think that that location. How deep is that? Um, that little it, these shelving units yes. here. Uh, yeah. typically twelve inches. So, but, 12 but we inches. could make that deeper. There, there's really. Okay. We've got some flexibility there. It could be deeper. Okay. All right. Large. Because I could see. And then how tall, how how high up does it go? That's full height right now. So, um, yeah, you know, well, six, basically eight. Florida's doing. Yeah. I mean, and, okay. So, you know, we have to, right now I have um, life jackets. Um, I have boards nailed across a win across a window with hooks in them and i have life jackets hanging from them so that's going to be a seasonal thing but i could see that um wouldn't it be fun if there weren't hooks up high for life jackets and then we had a thing like they have in retail stores with a hook to put them up on the hooks um and um and uh and then we even have on one end, we don't have the shelving go all the way and we have room for the paddles to be um, stored in there. Um, and so, you know, there's nothing on the floor there. So the paddles right now are in a milk carton. Um, so, um, and, uh, and, but we could, we could not use a milk carton if that made sense people feel like it would be ugly we could use something else um and then you know and then in the in the six or eight months of the year when we don't have kayaks those things would be stored somewhere else um and it would just be hooks up above there um and um and then there could be shelves and other things could be on there and while that collection is slowly growing you know, new books and DVDs could be put on display or there could be flyers in stands and things. Um, and that would be good if there was some kind of pull down thing or if there were sliding. Um, I think a pull down thing is better than sliding glass walls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, that, there's no place it, for the sliding walls to go other than kind of- Right, kind of, that's kind of, right. Kind of, yes, yeah. yeah. Do they ever get returned wet? like from use or i'm just wondering the oh the all the things of yes but if they get returned wet we just um so in my little 900 you know square foot library we manage to put them someplace where they can dry so we would do the same thing you know we just wouldn't um uh we just wouldn't hang them up so that they were dripping mm -hmm. um you know we'd put them outside over a railing or something. They dry fast because of the material mm -hmm. they're made of. Hang right. them up in the janitor's closet over the mops. <laughs> right. Um, what other, aside from life jackets and paddles, and I know this is a collection that doesn't exist and it's something that you're- Well, it, there's a little bit. So we have a telescope. Um, uh, let's see, we have a telescope. We have a DVD player that's in like a laptop case. Um, uh, we have a thing called a, tilo a kilowatt, which is in a case. Um, uh, we'll, you know, I think something we'll add pretty quickly is a metal detector because somebody has a brand one, new one that they've never used that they want us to take. Um, we'll have a, um, one of those new fangled cooktop devices. We'll have that soon actually um uh so what is it called an invection cooktop i think is what they're induction. called yes, induction yes induction there you go um yes um one of those and then some uh magnetic pans to go with it um so you know so those are all things the induction cooktop I, you know i could have um you know, it always takes me a long time because you have to create a, original records for those and figure out how you're going to circulate them. But um, so, and the telescope, I can send you the dimensions. I mean, it's ridiculous how much space the telescope telescope takes because it's in a big tote, um, in a big Rubbermaid tote. Um, 
And, you know, so it doesn't, like, I was thinking about having these things on display and they don't necessarily look pretty. You know, if the telescope is out of its box, it looks pretty cool, but that's not efficient in terms of loaning it. Um, so, um, so there are things like that. And then, you know, then I don't really know exactly what else they'll, we'll have, mm -hmm. but we, we will have other things. I Maybe wonder if that. we incorporate a closet somehow into that shelf. Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's going to have to be two feet deep. Yeah, right? exactly. That's what I'm thinking. To accommodate life jackets at, at yeah. a minimum. Right. Life jackets hanging up are going to be all, you know, maybe not quite two feet, but they're going to need roughly that much space, 18 inches to 24 inches. I'll measure them. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we could get a list, that would help. The cooktop yeah. also is going to sort of drive the, the depth. Yeah. But to, I, I think the telescope is the biggest thing. Yep. So before we had talked about, you know, say if that whole entire area was library of things and then you had your reception browsing on mobile shelving some sort of mobile shelving display that you can move um, when the library is closed but i am i am wondering if if in that reception browsing area where the shelving currently exists if you do build cabinets there to hold these library of things items can you put some sort of tack board or something that looks nice on the exterior of those cabinets so that Marianne, you can pin pictures of the library of things items on that. Some way that you can show what's in those cabinets in a way that is very appealing to the eye that allows you to house all of those things without them being visible in themselves. So you have a little bit of that messiness concealed within that entryway space, but still accessible to the public. Matt, I don't think we were thinking that they would have doors. I think we were just thinking it would have something that could be pulled down, like in a retail setting. Well, the um, other question but, is if you want to protect that collection and you have items that you're worried about, the pull down won't necessarily do that for you if it's up during the day. Right. So, but during the day, there'll be a staff person right at the desk. That's why originally I was thinking that the library of things would be stored in a cabinet in the staff workroom or behind the circulation desk. And then someplace there would be a display of items i just think um, you're not going to have enough space right. for storage of your work write. stuff so yeah. so i yeah. i would recommend the cabinets that you can lock and open doors just because you're so close to the entryway i know that right now it may not seem like an issue in our area we're seeing a lot of grab and steals not necessarily from libraries because they lock up the library of things but in retail stores there has been a, a rash of all of that in this area. Um, so it's something that you want to protect. And also, you know, if you have a child come in, if they can access the telescope and take it out and potentially damage, you know what I mean? So like you, you might not be at the desk all the time or have a right. staff member at the desk mm -hmm. all the time who can monitor that space. So I would just think about security and safety of the patrons as well who might be grabbing things or taking them you probably want to be doing that as a staff for liability reasons um taking it out taking it down and um getting them those items so that's just i'm just throwing that out there as an idea for how to handle that yeah i mean uh, the other way to look at that is a kind of combination of the two where you use doors that are like the you know with metal screening on them like you see in a lot of local history rooms where you're tr you want to be able to see the collection but also secure it so if you treated that storage area that enclosed storage area similarly you can see what's in there but you have to get a staff member to open it up for you to actually get it but you can see what's available um that may be a possibility a another thing that we could look at dominic and i, I know we've talked about this before and we're constantly fighting square footage here but mm -hmm. we had talked about extending this bump out 
down to kind of incorporate mm. the telecom room. And if we could somehow figure out a way to create a bigger space here that mm. allowed us to get both the telecom equipment, but also maybe that becomes a storage room for some of the bigger things like the cooktop and the telescope that maybe you don't want necessarily on display because they start to drive the size of it so much. Um, so I, I think we should look at that as a possibility. It it takes it out of play visually, which may or may, may not be the way you want to do it, Marianne. Um, but, mm -hmm. but we can look at it. I think though, regardless, you're going to have to have some way to display those. So what would be the most efficient use of space? Something that you can display what is actually in the library of things while also holding it? Or how would you handle, so these are just questions for you, Marianne, as you think about this space, um, how would you handle it if those items were behind that telecom room and then you had the display in that reception browsing? Because if you're just having pictures of those items up for people to see with no utility behind it other than that, is that an efficient use of the space for you? So that's just a question. I think if you can grab any extra storage anywhere, I would do it. So regardless of whether or not the library of things goes into that room behind the telecom room, but um, just thinking about, you know, dual purpose of the space using it the most efficiently as possible. So there's one other thing that I that we don't that we've talked about just a little bit that I don't see pictured, um, and that's a self checkout station. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, as you say that now, I think my preference from our previous discussion would be get the printer in the staff workroom, and then this is the optimal spot for that. Yes, I agree. Um, and. Um, Okay, and so, so the other thing is that the printer um, could also, well, okay. I mean, that is the optimal spot for a, mm -hmm. a, a self-checkout. Mm -hmm. um, no doubt about it. Um, and then I'm reluctant. Um, I'm, I want to tell you to go ahead and bump that out and add storage back there and then i also don't want to tell you to do that and Up i here. think yeah, yeah. um because because it's going to cost more money right so i'm not worried well yeah i think that's small compared to trying to meet our goal to stay under five thousand square feet because right. we are marginally we're right there so we've got to play we've got a massage right. there yes um the balloon okay. <laughs> right. And then remember, we're not going to have, uh, you know, I've, I've thought a little bit about the library of things in different ways. Um, uh, some libraries have really good web pages um, about their library of things. Um, uh, and then some libraries will, you know, have a picture and a description of an item in uh, you know, in DVD cases, um, and those are all on a shelf and people flip through those. Um, and I could see something like that. I don't think that this collection is going to, um, you know, burgeon from five or six items to, uh, to dozens of items overnight. Um, so, um, and, you know, and then some of the items will be things like puzzles and games, um, which will be pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. um, so I do like the idea of a closet, you know, of some kind of, of storage there. Um, I love the idea of people walking in there and, and seeing the life jackets there um, as, as awful as they look. Um, they... They they look awful and awesome all at the same time. I yeah I think I agree with you. I think it would be it would be nice to see a collection like that. I mean th those are the kinds of things that make a specific library unique to that community too. I mean you're not going to find paddles and life jackets at the Cambridge Library, you know. But 
Um, I, I, so I, I'm all for displaying it if there's room for it. Right. And if there's a, a right. good practical solution to it. Yes. And, you know, and like a couple of rows of hooks up high and then one of those holes like they have in retail stores i'll just run in and grab one and run out with it and take it um because i hear that people do that in retail stores nowadays <laughs> and, uh, you know i imagine i can uh get something like that easy enough and um and that would be fun i mean i it, because we have life vests i get um multiple requests every summer just to borrow life vests and because we have such limited space we only have enough to go with our hmm. kayaks but i'd like to be able to have enough life vests that people could just borrow what about vests. those um freestanding coat hook you know like the hat hat hangers you know freestanding has multiple hooks you could just have a tree and a an, right. kind of hook tree that's freestanding on roller casters or something Right. I hate those. Okay. So, cool. no, um, not yeah. <laughs> so, oh my God. We, we just Bad. sold one at the tag sale that came from um, a really fancy art show. And I, it didn't even occur to me to save it for that. But, but it's mm -hmm. better actually if they can be kind of stretched out because they're different mm -hmm. sizes um, and you mm -hmm. need to be able to find the appropriate size. Mm -hmm. There are you know, four different adult sizes and then two different kid sizes. So it's nice if they can be spread out by size. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll measure, I'll measure how deep they are now because they're hanging up now mm -hmm. um, two to a hook and I'll, I'll measure how deep that is, um, you know, and then we'd want a couple of it and then they're squishy. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. but the, the biggest thing is say if the telescope were out there on the bottom in its Rubbermaid tote, and then the closet were as deep as the narrow, you know, so the long, um, the narrow width, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, that could be on the bottom and then that could then dictate how high that shelf is. And then maybe the cooktop is also on the bottom and then, mm -hmm. um, some if you could thing. send those details to us, that'd be helpful. I will. Like, yeah, I that'd will. be great. Yeah. yeah. I'll measure nice. the um, you know, I'll measure the telescope and I'll measure the um life vests when I get nice. back in today. Is the yeah. is the um rubber made tub it didn't come with a telescope. I assume that that's just an easy way and a safe way to store it. Well, yeah. So the um, it's how it's stored and transported, and the the astronomy club that provided the telescope, you know, put it in that, and right. it's you well, know it's I, much bigger than the telescope. Right. What so, I was going to suggest yeah. is, I wonder if it's worth investigating because there are a lot of sort of aftermarket storage solutions, bat you know, bags for different all kinds of things. There must be out there a padded bag that would be big enough to house the telescope and protect it in transport, but be smaller than a Rubbermaid storage tub. It is yeah. how they've done it for all of the libraries. It also comes with two pillows. The The bag comes with two pillows? The, the, the storage the, tub. Storage yeah. tub. Yeah. And then that there's a, um, a telescope, not a telescope. Uh, binoculars in a box that are uh -huh. also in the tub. Yeah. So you haven't borrowed your telescope from your local library, Matt. No, you I know? have not. Oh, you're missing out. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. Okay. Nice. Um, great. So we'll we'll consider all of that, um, Marianne. Okay. And once we get that yes. information from you, that'll help okay. us program. Um, right. So this has been really helpful. That's covered a lot this space um i'm happy to move on unless anybody else has any other comments um i just want to say one thing about the printer station hmm. so if you put it in the workroom marianne would you be going back and doing the transaction for printing for patrons in that manner right well hopefully it would people could print wirelessly or they'd be printing from the library computers or i'd be printing for them 
And then it would just be a staff person going back and grabbing the printouts and bringing them and handing them to the patron. And there would be no photocopier. Um, well, it would be a printer. It would be a photocopier. Okay. Um, and it would scanning? be a printer photocopy. It would have scanning. Okay. So you would, would have all to do that. Now. Yeah. So you would have to do that right. as staff rather than having right. people scan right. on their own. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so these elevations we've covered. Um we didn't really get into the weeds of um, the circulation desk. I just wanted to show you some sections to describe, you know, stand, sitting height and um, the book drop um, detail to be able to incorporate that into the counter and then um, uh, drawers. So we'll treat it as millwork and we'll continue to design it. I did, um, depending on our discussion, want to show you these so this is an off-the-shelf product that we've used in the past that we like um, which would give you that flexibility to move it but not necessarily flexibility to program it you know put the book slot in they do customization um, but um, so I've got that here not totally relevant at this point following a conversation um, and then lastly as, as relating to the large plan where I'd highlighted um, we had discussed pre in previous meetings about the children's um, cubby um, seating bench um, on the north facade. Um, so I just wanted to provide a view here for you to see um, how that might look. We need to incorporate um, mechanical heating that's going to be in behind this millwork so that that can serve um, the glazed wall. But... Um, we can continue to progress this design um, to give you dimensions and kind of storage capacity here while still working as a um, a nice bench for the children's space. I think it'd be great for kind of group reading sessions, you know, that there's um, any number of kind of programmatic um, uh, events that can happen in this space. Can I ask one question with this too? Sorry, I sure. feel like I'm talking yeah. a lot today, but the... No, super helpful. <laughs> So Marianne, for your cleaning of the library, what is your situation? Um, well, so when we've been having conversations as a town and uh, we were talking about applying for the Small Library Pilot Project grant, we explained that we, you know, we tried to specify a library that could be supervised and managed by one staff person. Um, and, but that we would, but that this new facility would need janitor services and that we would expect to have a dedicated janitor for three hours a week. Um, and uh, the current library gets janitor services maybe three hours a year. Um, so, uh, uh, um, so, um, so anyway, so I don't know why you're asking that question. So the way, reason why I'm asking is because okay. <clears throat> you're going to have to Windex this area a lot, just to let you know. I think the juxtaposition with nature is is very good and excellent, and we want to maintain that. Um, but I also, I'm just asking too, because the grates in the back of the bench, how big are those? openings going to be how much yep. is going to get dropped down in there like these are just questions for overall use yep. of the space um because children are going to drop things in those grates and and how are they going to how is it going to be kept so that i'm assuming they're not going to be hot so that if they put their little hands or knees or uh, anything there it wouldn't hurt no. them it's, it'll um, be warm air warm, warm air, air definitely okay yeah it's not going to be direct to the heating um, assembly, but um, that's a good question. And we have implemented this strategy before in past projects. My sense, and I have to double check on the detail, it's less than quarter of an inch kind of opening. I think it's pretty small. Can things fall in there? Potentially. Um, but it's a good question. It's something I think I need to review the exact, um, you know, the specifics of the heating element so that we can, verify that if something pops in there that's not a concern 
and whether you know how these grills are fastened as well you don't want people to be able to just pick them up so they're kind of fastened down um yeah they're, the that, grills are usually removable i mean it, it a lot depends on what we end up specifying here you know is mm -hmm. this is this a product that comes with its own housing and its own grill or are we creating a trough that say a fin it's not going to be fin tube but some heater goes into the trench and then we do our own grill on top of it either way the grills usually are designed so that you know the the slots are less than the thickness of a pencil so you can't get you know pens and pencils dropping in there but a paper clip could go through it you know so that it, it's impossible to make it impenetrable right but it's we try to select grills that are as tight as possible they are removable so that you can get in there and clean if you have to vacuum it out or whatever okay. um, but again it depends a little bit on what the heating product is that we use uh, and that's something we'll be getting into a little bit more with our engineers but it's it's noted and and we'll be thinking about those things as we select those products thank you um so that was this slide then going on to the exterior just following up from um the conversations that you all had at the, the last presentation we wanted to show you some images of the wood siding the vertical wood siding um, that you see here um, as part of the pop-out window and the entry underneath the um, overhang and looking at the two uh, different stain options there are multiple stain options but you know these two we wanted to show um, to you um, following the discussion you had um, Matt had uh, I'll quickly I should have put these slides up Matt had shared these to you previously so that you could see that the Akoya product um, uh, comes with a stain, can be treated following installation with stains, but then also has a natural weathering process. And so these slides kind of give you an indication of how they weather over time. Um, so we wanted to get a sense from you what you liked out of the, the two finishes. Um, so we have a more natural look here um, up against a, a darkened stain, like a blackened look. And then I'm looking at the east elevation as well. Um, the natural against the blackened. We have we favor one over the other and it has to do with the finishes we're using on the rest of the building. Um, but we'd like to get a sense from you guys as well. I don't know, Matt, whether it's even necessary for you all to weigh in on this. Now these we wanted to just share and, and we can, um, you know, get a, in, yeah, a so uh, preference. From basically the, this is a question of aesthetics, but it's also a question of maintenance. Um, and Jeff, you weren't on the call last week, but just to, bring you up to speed. Akoya is one of the modified wood products that we've been considering. Um, unlike some of the other products like Kebony or uh, Adobo, um, Akoya is a, is a chemically modified, not thermally modified wood. So basically they pickle it with a kind of vinegar solution. Um, mm -hmm. of, the, of the modified woods out there, it has the best warranty by far. It's a 50 year warranty. Um, that warranty is affected by different things that you do, like is it above ground? It's actually rated to go below grade too. We're not doing that. Um, you, and it, that affects the warranty. But the other things that can affect its performance over time are the treatments. Um, it, it's all, regardless of the, the final look of it, it's all the same wood. It's all pine. Uh, that pine is treated chemically. And then there is a kind of topical process. And that can either be um, a thermal finish where they they actually torch it so it it kind of chars the outside of the wood. Um, they've they have moved beyond that in more recent years and they have now a very wide range of stains that they apply to the wood. And and what this chart shows is one of those stains. In this case, the stain is called Palawan. The two C means two coats. So upper left is as installed. Um, it comes with one coat on it. Once it's installed, they put another coat on it. So that's the two coats. 
And then this is weathering over time. This is accelerated weathering because it's on a um, a 45 degree angle out at, at their you know plant um, in full sun and and rain. So it, it's a lot more exposure than a night than a vertical surface would get. So this is accelerated. So, so the bottom level. right is nine months of accelerated weathering. And that, you know, you can just kind of see how it changes a little bit over time. So if you want to maintain the look of the kind of natural wood, whatever stain color you start with, you need to, after it starts to show signs of weathering, and, and by weathering, I mean turning gray, because that's ultimately what will happen if you don't do anything to it. it it'll weather like, like any natural wood product would. It'll turn a kind of silver gray. If you want to preserve the original color, then you have to keep applying this coat to it. And it's a one coat and it it is probably, you know, a kind of three to five year cycle. We have very little wood on the job and it's all, you know, nothing is higher than, say, eight or nine feet, probably. So it's easy to do. It wouldn't take a lot of product to do it. And it would be like a one or, or sorry, a three to five year cycle we think um that that's our personal preference because the natural the the eaves where we have exposed wood are not going to weather because they are so they're out of the sun they're not going to get rained on and so they're they're really never going to turn silver gray they're going to stay close to the natural color um as this wood weathers if we were just to leave it alone and have it weather on its own and it turns gray Number one, we would see differential weather, and you can see where the shadow hits the wood at, on either side of the entrance. The upper half of that will weather more slowly than the bottom half of that wall. So if we yeah. don't treat it, then you'll see that differential weathering over time. And so that's why they make the gray stain. And the, the idea of the gray stain is that, and Dominic, if you put up that weathering chart for the gray, um, the gray stain is a way to hide the differential weathering and just kind of let things take their course, but not see what's happening sort of behind the scenes naturally. So upper, upper left is as installed with a gray stain. Bottom right is as the stain kind of wears off, but the wood is weathering on its own naturally, you're getting, it's turning the kind of silver gray on its own. Um, I, we think though that the gray is as nice as that is, we think the gray, it, it's gonna in effect be three different looking products. You're gonna have the slate and then you're gonna have two different tones of wood. You're gonna have the wood that didn't weather and then the wood that was sort of artificially weathered. Um, so again, that's that's our preference, but but the natural wood look means that you have to go back and add a coat of the stain to it every, you know, whatever the cycle is, three years, five years, you know, depends a little bit on exposure. Um, and, and it's hard to predict exactly what that, what that cycle would be, but again, it's not a lot of wood. And so. It, what color is the uh, slate going to be? The slate is a, well, what we're proposing is a green slate, which is okay. basically what you see here. It's sort of a grayish green. Okay. And and we don't have to decide this now, as Dominic said, but the these are the decisions that we will have to make. I think maybe more fundamentally, um, we should get everybody's comfort level with Akoya, although between a 50-year warranty for the wood siding and, you know, a, and slate siding, which is basically a 100-year material, these are going to, you know, be be effectively maintenance free with the exception of potentially recoding the wood every few years for the life of the building so we think akoya is a great product you know 50 year warranty is pretty phenomenal for a wood product but yeah. even if you coat the wood with the stain let's, let's go back to the other elevation you're still going to get a difference in coloring between what's protected by the overhang and or the roof and what's not it just won't be as extreme correct it, it won't be as extreme and th and that's true regardless of what color stain we go with right um, exactly if, 
Dominic, if you put up that weathering chart again for the quote unquote natural color. Yeah, so, I mean, these are in a fairly tight range, right, of, of weathering. So, but yeah, to your point, you may have in the same wall, a section that looks like, you know, the upper row and then a section that looks like the bottom row kind of in the same wall yeah. depending on its exposure and how much sun it's getting um but it's but it's a pretty tight range of of weathering difference i think and and this chart is showing something that's stained or this is the natural the, no all of their products are stained all the products are stained okay yeah. all right so it's a question, it. uh, unless it's unless you go with the charred wood, which is actually, you know, like the the sort of traditional Japanese treatment where they 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 basically flame torch the surface of the wood, and it and that char creates a protective layer, sort of like um, core ten steel. You know, the rust is the protective layer for for what's behind it. The rust. Okay, so the decision the decision isn't so much. Um, no stain versus stain the decision is really what color stain exactly that's right so all i can tell you is now that we're Stephen and i are on the building committee maintenance on town buildings is not stellar when it comes to exterior painting and staining um so that's something that we'll have to deal with as an issue no matter which way we go mm -hmm. Marianne. Right. So. And so it's a 50 year warranty if we do nothing. Right. No, we have to do something. It's it's a fifth yes, the product has a 50 year warranty. Um but it, but it has to be stained for the 50 year warranty. It has to be stained, yeah. Okay. It and has you, to be stained every three to five years. No, it has to no. it has to be stained initially so it's going to when right. it's installed on the building it's going to have a stain on it. it it might be that you put it on the building and it only has one coat of stain and you never put another coat of stain on it and it's not going to change the warranty but it's going to change the way that it looks over time so so mm -hmm. a decision about staining what one coat two coat color is purely aesthetic has nothing to do with with their their warranty as far as I understand from my uh, meeting with their rep. The the other thing I'll mention is that they have a, uh, I think I mentioned this in our last meeting, they offer a program where they will come and install a mock-up on your site um, in whatever orientation you want that, and, you know, and as many of these as you want. I, I don't know how big they are, maybe four feet by four feet or something like that. Um, but, you know, a size that's big enough that you can see it and you can kind of see how it performs over time. And they it's a couple hundred bucks per panel. So if you want to see what it looks like in real life and you want to see what it looks like from now until the time this goes out to bid, we could install a couple of panels out on the site and defer the decision about you know, what kind of stain we want to go with until we sort of see it in real time. So that's that's an option. Okay, and, and OE's recommendation for stain color is which? I mean, from, again, purely aesthetic, I think our recommendation yeah. would be to go with the, the natural, to kind of preserve the natural color because as it turns gray, it's more different than the eaves, which are also wood, but they are not going to weather the way that the siding is. And so I think to to keep it a simpler palette and have the color of the slate and the color of the natural wood to us seems like a, a better choice. But I tend to agree with that logic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Penny, I saw your hand up and um, Stephen, I'll get to you after. Yeah, I have just a general question as we're talking about exterior finishes and interior finishes. Is there an opportunity to see these products in person before deciding? I've seen the green yes. slate. I think it's beautiful, but 
I don't think anyone else on the committee has seen this. And um, I, I think it would be valuable to see in hand samples um, before committing to something. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I agree. Part of the process is that we would have an in person meeting with you um, with physical samples, both interior and exterior. And they're kind of, um, they happen from here throughout the design phases. Um, we can give you um, installed examples to go and investigate and, and maybe get a better sense of how these things age as well. Um, we've used, you know, the slate, for instance, on the Norwell Public Library. Um, and so we can give you a kind of list of some of the finishes and um, where you might be able to see them installed, but we will definitely share physical samples with you in the meeting that we can set up down the line. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we'll we'll do that in a way that you can see all the materials together. So the, the slate, the wood, the proposed color for the window frames, the roof color, and the the concrete faced um, insulation product that we're suggesting for the base of the building. And we'll put them all together kind of, you know, on a table so you can see how they look as a as a color palette. Um, and and I mean, there are options for the slate. There are really uh, probably four options for slate. There's the green, there's purple, there's a mixture of green and purple together, which I, I don't personally like so much. And then there's gray. The gray is getting a little more difficult to get and it has everything to do with what sort of vein they're in in the quarry at the time. Um, some some colors are more available at times than others. Uh, the, right now, from what I've heard, the gray is a little harder to get. Um, green historically has been the most reasonably priced. Um, we also think it would look nice in this context with the mm -hmm. uh, kind of natural context. Um, Stephen, you had a question. No, uh, you're on. We, Stephen. Sorry, um, I think Matt answered most of my questions. But at Norwell, uh, are, is that the green slate? Yes, it is. Yeah. And is it the uh, same siding with the uh, the stain that you're preferring? It's not. That's actually Alaskan yellow cedar. Okay. Um, and and it has a weathering stain on it at Norwell. Um, so that's not the natural cedar color, but it's close to it. Um, but it would be similar to the lighter stain yeah. on this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Matt, there are there are competitive products to this out there. This is not a proprietary type thing. It's not a proprietary thing. There are other products we could specify. Um, it, it it used to be one of the more expensive ones. The cost differential between the various products has evened out, um, and they are the only one that offers a fifty year warranty. So we can. I mean, so you know, in terms of writing the spec, we can definitely list other products that that would be sort of alternates to this or, or you know, the kind of three equals, so to speak. Um, this would be our preferred. And so we might want to think about how we write the spec to sort of suggest that this was the basis of design, but here are a couple of other products that you could use. The warranty won't be as good. I don't know if we can specify the 50 year warranty in the spec because at that point it becomes a little harder to to meet because they're, they're as far as i know they're the only one that offers the 50 year warranty um that's one of the questions i had asked the rep when we spoke and he was going to talk to their supplier and sort of find out how they've done that in the past on public work so just just full disclosure to the committee, unless it's voted as a proprietary product, which I don't think we could have a good basis for wood siding as being proprietary. Um, the committee would have to be open to any altern any alternative materials that were listed as equal. 
and that may affect the warranty. Yep. Okay. Um, so we'll get back to you about that as we find out more information from um, resawn timber. Um, so um, we we met with a bunch of consultants, one of which was Ascentic, our um, acoustic um, consultant. Um, and so I wanted to quickly go through a couple of items that were brought up, uh, namely um, acoustic treatment in, in most of the rooms um, for sound deadening qualities. Um, we were hoping, I believe we shared in the previous meeting, we were hoping to achieve um, no acoustic baffle systems in the ceilings, um, but Ascentic has said that um, we do need to provide that in fact, but I'd like to show you a couple of options that we can use for the ceilings. Um, so for instance, in the meeting room lobby, adults and children's, um, those ceilings are open to the roof deck above. And um, we um, would need to now incorporate either acoustic baffles or a wood slat system um, to meet the acoustic requirements for those spaces. We would pair along with those ceiling treatments, we would pair that with um, acoustical treatment on the upper uh, walls as well in those spaces. I'll show you some imagery of, of those locations um, further on. So that would be a perforated JIP product um, that would then meet the needs that we're trying to achieve in those spaces. Um, so you can see here from the plan, um, this light beige brown, uh, um, the acoustic baffles or wood slat treatment in the ceilings. Um, the uh, the pinkish is perforated um, uh, perforated board, gypsum wall board um, that we would use in reception and browsing. Um, we would use just hard gyp in the restrooms, um, whereas everywhere else in the in the lower ceilings, um, in the, noted in blue would be an ACT, an acoustic ceiling tile system. So we'd use that throughout. Can I ask a, a simple question? Why are we putting ceiling in a water service, telecom, and janitor's closet? Um, we don't necessarily have to, actually, there. Um, so uh, I know that we are looking to use that plenum space for mechanical equipment. Um, so... Um, we're going to have VRF, VRF units um, and ducting kind of and whether they end up being located exactly in that location. We haven't defined that yet, but I'll review with our engineers um, as to the requirement for ceilings for um, acoustic ceiling tiles there. And same with that big electric room. Why are we putting a ceiling in there? Um, I'll follow up with code on that. That's that's got to be a one hour rated room, as does the book drop. So yeah, we might actually need a hard ceiling in those two rooms. Yep, and not ACT. And not ACT. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. So, so I'll review I, that. Um, to, to your point, though, Jeff, I think you know as long as we can, we we don't need a ceiling in the in water service, telecom, janitor's closet, storage, even really. As long as we recognize that we're going to have equipment and probably some duct work and things like that above, that it would all be visible. Again, I yeah. think electric and book drop will need a ceiling to get the rating in those rooms. Mm -hmm. If there's an opportunity to save a few bucks and not do a ceiling, we can certainly do that in the rooms where it makes sense. Well, it's also going to be easier to run your cabling if there yeah. isn't a ceiling. Yes, we. Yeah. Okay. Um, Minor. Yep, that will make those revisions and for those spaces for sure. Um, so that's covering ceiling and wall treatments as per this reflected ceiling plan. There's also a couple of other notes that I wanted to bring up here. Um, we are using a demounted um, glazed wall partition system for the staff workroom, teams, directors, and study rooms. Um, they are also being evaluated by the acoustic engineer. So 
what is nice about those systems is that you can get acoustical ratings for the doors in one system. It's a kind of off the shelf. It simplifies installation. Um, you just have to frame out a rough opening and then this system can be installed. It also gives you long-term flexibility in those spaces that they're demandable. So you can just simply remove them. Um, so uh, I also wanted to bring up that um, they recommended that we provide acoustical rated wall assembly around the director's office. So that's going to be a double, um, it'll be an offset double stud wall assembly for these two spaces, um, giving you um, uh, privacy in, in this space. Um, and they also recommend on top of that, um, a sound masking speaker system for this project. So, that's um, accomplished with, uh, a, it's basically a speaker system that you can either hang in these open um, ceilings or you can have them recess within ceiling systems that would be located in public kind of thoroughfare circulation spaces, adults and children's. And they emit um, a kind of like a white noise. It's, it's barely noticeable. I think but it's it just, pink noise. Is it pink? Oh, it's called pink noise. It's nice. Pink noise. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's it's kind of like a very light hush kind of um sound. And it it gives everybody in their local space the sense of privacy because um you pick up that sound instead of the audibility of a conversation happening way over on the other side of the room kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we've used commonly in our um, past projects. We recommend it here. We'll roll it into um, the DD pricing effort and see where we um, land with that. They're generally fairly inexpensive on our experience. So um, we'll look to incorporate that and coordinate that into this project. Um, it's a system that won't be installed in the meeting room, but directly outside we will. So it would be the lobby, reception, browsing, circulation, and the larger spaces, the smaller offices and, and workrooms studies, they don't need it in there. Dominic? Okay, um, if you have questions after somebody else. Sure. Go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. Um, so we've been doing our post-occupancy visits from after the pandemic. Well, we're still in the pandemic, but you know what I mean. Um, mm -hmm. We've been in normal operation for a year. And we are hearing that the perforated gypsum board is not effective, mm -hmm. especially in spaces that are tiled. So mm -hmm. I just want to bring that up as a concern that it's mm -hmm. not actually mitigating sound in the way that I think it's intended to. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's installation or exactly what the issue is, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to bring that up as a potential concern especially okay. given that that's going to be the noisiest area in the library other than the children's room. Yep. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, in our discussions with Ascentech, they, and the specificity of the installation is critical to its performance. And that's something they want to over, uh, oversee as well. So we were having discussions about um, how we install it and making sure there's, you know, uh, insulation behind it. Um, the other thing to that they brought up was its a, a relative adjacency to mechanical equipment as well. And so, you know, if you now have a perforated product that behind which you have mechanical equipment, that's also a consideration too. So um, we're going to vet products as well. And it depends on the perforation size, the, you know, the array of, um, the opening. So they will, we're glad to have them on board because they'll really kind of scrutinize that product, its installation, and make sure we get the best STC performance um, out of it. Did they do that on Norwell, just out of curiosity? Um, I, Chris Genta led the coordination with that. I don't remember, Matt, whether we had I, them I in, don't on board. If the yeah. was involved in that okay. or not. Yeah, I, I would know, just check in I'm, with them because they were one of them, and it wasn't. Yeah, it, it there were other libraries designed yep. by other firms that had the same issue. So, yep. um, it's a good 
It's a good point. And I know the specific concern that was raised in Norwell, where we did have tile and lower ceilings than these conditions. And we only had perforated gyp there. Um, that was for Norwell here. We are coupling with a baffle system in the ceiling. So I think we're already going to be, um, you know, many steps ahead in, in the performing capabilities of this, these spaces. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Stephen, you had a question. I think Jeff was also want to speak. So uh, I understand just yeah. baffles. I don't understand what the wood slap means. I'll, Can you explain I'll, that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll show you examples of it. So it's basically um, a wood slat assembly. Um, there are the slats themselves are about one inch wide and they come at different depths. And it's a ray of them on a backing structure that is then coupled with an acoustic um, uh, insulation behind it. So it's installed with a, an air gap behind it's usually actually installed in a um a wall a, a ceiling grid system so similar to an act grid system that you suspend um these can be hung in that it's basically um maybe i should just go to an image i'm going to race ahead here um can you all okay. still understand that um I didn't actually have a product, but am I still sharing or did I? No. 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 Okay. We see you. Yeah. Nice. Definitely not a slat system. Um, so if you can see that there. So these, this was the project we used them in Webster. And um, here I think they're about a four inch deep wood panel so they're they're installed Talking vertically the ceiling, the ceiling yeah. in this picture? that's correct yep oh okay now i get it yep and so because of the air gap between each slat you're allowing for the sound to kind of dissipate within that assembly it also comes paired with a backing acoustic um, insulation behind it and that helps deaden sound as well yeah the, the wood is really just a visual screen the, yep. the the real acoustic performance is what happens behind the wood, right? You have a couple inches of just raw fiberglass bats, basically, that are absorbing the sound. And the wood makes it so that you don't see that stuff. Yeah, uh, It's the kind of cosmetic. So you would attach this on the underside of the wood, the wood deck ceiling? That's so, right. So as uh, we look to compare the two products, um, one, you know, the, the 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 holistic intent here is to ex to express the warmth of the wood, right? We're using glue lamp structure. We also have tongue and groove decking as one option right. here. And so one option would be to use acoustic baffles, which are suspended in between the structural right. cavity, allowing you to see through them and up to the tongue and groove decking. Now, if we went right. with this system, the wood slat, um, the panels, we could sub out the tongue and groove decking, save money there. We could go with a structural ply because you would end up not perceiving it with this wood slat grill being applied onto it. But we're bringing back a holistic wood expression to the ceiling um, and then still achieving our acoustic performance. So we we're presenting here two options um you know initially i think in um the beginning of schematic design we were considering these um acoustic baffles um which we had done in norwell um but um they come in different colors so we could get close to the tone of the the glue lamb or the tongue and groove decking but um if we go to this system we get similar performance um, the additional cost of these wood slat acoustic panels can be offset by the fact that we would change out the tongue and groove structural decking to just a regular ply. Dominic, why don't you go to the interior views? Because I think it, it, it is maybe a little more clear. Oh, you're not seeing that? I've been scrolling no, between no. them. 
just we're on the Webster reading. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me share again. I think it just got stuck. Um, I'm going to stop share and share again. Can you see that now? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the slot. Yeah. So this and is the slot. Bad. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I, I switched between the two. So the wood slat here, you can tell, you know, gives a more cohesive wood aesthetic compared to, you know, there's a more intermittent wood warmth, but you would see, you would be able to see through these baffles. So right. we've now located something that is realistic to meet acoustic goals, uh, acoustic performance goals. So we've upped the, um, we've included an additional row of baffle here to meet performance requirements. And you can see here again, paired with an um, perforated um, drywall treatment of the wall, um, of the upper wall here on the left. And Dominic, go, keep going to the photo of the interior of, all right, so that's the perforated jib. This, yep. These are the baffles. Yep. So perforated jib here. Sorry, I'm flying through. Matt's looking to get to the adults room view that we have for the Shootsbury Library. This is where we used um, perforated jib in Webster. And you can see um, the the sense of that treatment in the upper clear story here. Um, and this is the baffles we used in Norwell. Um, we Here they are gray. We You can get them in white as well, um, which we have. So you can definitely see through them and um up into the wood decking so with the baffles we think that it's important to hang on to the tongue and groove wood decking right because right. you still Actually, you're still going to see yeah. that wood decking and the benefit is it's structural but it's also cosmetic right you you you're exposing the underside right. if we were to go with a different product and the the cost there's a cost difference between the baffles and the and the um, slatted wood yeah. and and there are other slatted wood products out there that we can mm -hmm. look at but if we went with that type of system the cost of it is higher than the cost of the baffles and so we would offset that by switching to a structural sheathing that is isn't anymore something that you're going to see and so we could do a cheaper structural layer because it's not going to be exposed um, and we think that we could do that and offset the cost so that they'd be you know roughly the same price or at least that that would be the goal um and the thinking was that this the wood slat with the wood beams is more in a way more monolithic than the baffles the baffles are a, a different material different color than the wood um and whereas the wood slat we would pick a wood slat product that's you know a good match to the to the exposed wood structure so and, and I assume depending on if we go baffle or slat, it affects the kind of lighting we would be using. So that's the example. Next, yeah, the that's a good work on blocks of light. That's a good point. And the next step we've met with our lighting consultant. Um, we did a day, they did a day lighting analysis, but the next step is a fixture strategy. Um, how we handle lighting throughout the project. So I think there's many different ways that we can handle lighting and whether fixtures are kept up high in, you know, and kind of incorporated within this upper ceiling or they're suspended and brought down lower, um, as you can see in, you know, here yeah, we have different right. strategies. Um, yeah, some more pendant. Yep. So this yeah. is only pendant but there are different elevations too you see some kind of cans up higher yeah. here compared to more decorative and then here you you can see that we're able to house um down lights actually within the wood grill system i don't know how much space we would have in our assembly um, because we have smaller glue lamps to be able to do this but again um we've got um lamb our consultants um who we're looking forward to working with actually next week to to get a sense of um lighting strategies for the building so yeah um, that'll be okay. the next step yeah and um, so you need to... okay. 
we're not necessarily looking for a decision today. These are two different ways of of trying to solve the acoustic mitigation, um, a, a solution for acoustic treatment in these two rooms. And they, they have a different look. And, you know, you, you can tell us today if you hate one of them or both of them. Um, otherwise, we can continue to sort of keep both in play. I, I think they, the, the wood slat one requires probably a little more investigation in terms of what the pro what this exact product is, what would the trade-off be in terms of switching from a tongue and groove two inch thick structural wood deck to a plywood product for the for the sheathing. We'll have to work through that with a structural engineer and our cost estimator. I mean we we could even carry a couple of options all the way through DD pricing and, and use the pricing as the way to decide unless you have a strong opinion visually you know one strategy versus the other my personal preference and this is just me is i like the baffles but i i wouldn't rule out the other approach either the other approach to me looks a little bit more finished mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more polished which i don't necessarily want to be finished or polished for this building okay that's... um that's just my approach yeah. i do have another question on the perforated gypsum board mm -hmm. if how do you clean it um dust tub wipe it down you can um, paint it too you can paint it too that's right yeah you can paint it yeah, yeah. yep yeah no all right yeah i'm not familiar with it so oh, thank you okay yeah um, Stephen, you had a question. Well, I think Jeff uh, just asked the uh, two questions I had because my concern would be with the perforated jip board, especially the sample that appeared to have uh, small holes in it. If you paint mm -hmm. it and um, it starts to get filled with paint, that would seem to uh, affect its performance or capability. Uh, and, and, you know, the cleaning seems like that could be kind of an issue too. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't had, we haven't seen that there, there were issues in projects past. Um, I know we used it as a wall application. It was up high here in Webster. We've used it as ceiling treatments in Norwell. Um, Matt, was there anywhere else where it was in a wall application? I'm trying to think as a um, reference for us. No, I think Webster's yeah. the only place where we've done yeah. it on all surface. And it was up high. I think they spray yeah. painted. I mean, th this was all painted, though, after it was installed. You know, it was yeah. mudded and sanded and painted. Yeah. And there weren't any issues in terms of the holes getting blocked. Yep. Um, you know, I, I suppose that depending on how the paint's applied and over time, is it possible? Maybe. But I think... Um, I think you can control it. They, I do remember that they actually have a tool that's sort of like a, it's like a pizza cutter almost that for when you're mudding it in, if, it, if you get mud in a couple of the holes, you sort of run this tool and it's, it's calibrated to the pattern so that it sort of re, you know, it's like an aerator for your lawn, but it sort of clears out the holes. Um, but it, but I think there are ways to manage that so that they don't get clogged. Those those holes don't get clogged. Matt, I I assume also that you could affect the same acoustical treatment with a, a I'll say a more traditional fabric wrapped panel of some sort if if need be. Um, you could, yeah. I mean, there are other products too that that are. And there's acoustic plaster, which which isn't as easy to clean, and you can't paint it. I wouldn't recommend it because I think it's a it's a much fussier product. It's more expensive. Um, yeah, the I mean the fabric wrapped wall panel is sort of the the lowest spec option. So we'll keep Mary. And 
And um, Stephen, what do you think of the baffle versus the wood slat? Um, I uh, so this is the wood slat that's pictured now. Um, I I like how this looks better than the baffle. And the uh, baffles have a uh, color character more sympathetic to the wood. Yeah, you can. Um, I don't the have color options are a bit limited, though. A little bit, yeah. 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 I mean, these Thank these you. are rendered as white. We used a gray in Norwell. Right. Um, there are beige, almond kind yeah. of color qualities, too, that are available. But I think that we need to you know we like for me the the most important factor is price so yeah you know whatever is going to do the job that we needed to do for the most economical option is what i'm um what i'm most interested in mm -hmm. do the lighter color baffles get dirty if you have air coming out with dust and because I know the gray ones don't show it, but mm -hmm. if you're specking white or lighter color for this space, just wondering. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, we haven't used the white before, so I don't I don't know how they hold up over time, perform over time. We we will not have any air in the ceiling, so the air delivery probably is going to be in the zone sort of below the perforated gypsum and above the openings along that wall we'll probably have slot linear slot diffusers along the length of that wall that's delivering the air kind of you know halfway up the the volume of space and so i don't know that there's going to be a lot of i mean there's always going to be air circulation and dust get it you know but but there isn't going to be air blowing on those baffles i don't think um, like we might have if the air was being delivered from the ceiling. Um, but it's a good question. And that's something we could ask Armstrong, you know, how do they, what have they seen in the past? And, that, you know, we don't want to have to get up there and clean them for sure. I think my vote currently is the uh, wood slat, you know, and if, if in fact they were spaced close enough that you could change to the Structural plywood decking as opposed to the tongue and groove. Um, sounds like, Dominic, you think that might be somewhat of a wash. That's right. Early um, indications suggest that I did kind of quick takeoffs. We just need to, I do need to confirm the spec on a, the structural ply still from the structural engineer, but I know for sure it's not going to be in the realm of um, tongue and groove decking. So we can continue to hold on to both. Um, this is another installation um, kind of office, commercial office fit out where we're using that slat ceiling again, um, but also um, using a demandable glazed wall partition. So I just wanted to give you an example of that visually. We think it's a nice, clean aesthetic. Um, it simplifies installation and... Um, gives you long-term flexibility if you ever wanted to remove them. It's a great way to control acoustic, you know, kind of pet wrapped in, in this umbrella of acoustic treatment for the library or strategies, I should say. It's a great way to be able to control that um, for the, the study rooms and then where we're using it throughout the room, uh, the project. Um, so kind of flying through day lighting. Um, so we met with our lighting consultant. They started off initially with a day lighting analysis. As I said earlier, we're going to meet with them again um, to better understand um, lighting strategies um, regards to fixtures. But so they did a lighting and a day lighting analysis and basically um, um, incorporated a um, a modeling software that was able to. Um, indicate um, all times of the year and then we could kind of evaluate between summer equinox and winter where we're seeing um, sunlight coming into the building so you can see here early in the morning um, mid-summer um, 
north is to the right. Um, so you can see here sun kind of coming in the, through the clear story of the children's rooms, um, the study and um, the teens room. I'll, I'll kind of fly through these fairly quickly. Um, so you can see the progression here, 10 a.m. Midday in summer, obviously the sun is very high. You're not seeing a lot of sunlight coming through. We were most interested in the meeting room. So here you're not seeing a lot of um, uh, solar gain unnecessarily. You know, this is two in the afternoon. Um, 4 p.m. It starts to become an, an issue. Um, you can see also a little bit here in the um, staff workroom. Um, and then late in the evening, you know, 6 p.m., you're getting far reaching light coming in. Um, we, you know, we know that we're going to need shades throughout the project. So this is just a very good process to kind of really evaluate where's sun coming in, what are the what are the critical times of the day. Um and it, it would depend on your opening hours too, Marianne. Um, you know, I know there are some later hours um, where this would be affected or after hours even for the meeting room space. Um, now we're looking at Equinox early in the morning, um, 10 a.m. So maybe a little bit more light here coming through in the study room. Um, they were also considering the tree layout um surrounding the building um in look in talking to the landscape architects you know it depends on what those trees are Are they evergreens as well which they most likely wouldn't be so um but trees will definitely play a part in shading um for the building but we do also need to make sure that we have decent exposure for photovoltaics for the solar system on the on the roof as well um so here you can see midday um, you know, we've got some light coming into the meeting room in the afternoon. Um, you know, late afternoon, it seems to be the critical time of the day where the meeting room is seeing exposure there. Um, and then 6 p.m. Uh, <coughs> winter early in the morning, next to no sun coming through. 10 a.m., you're starting to see that. Um, that, that, I would say this is a condition because of the surrounding forested areas, um, which is being calculated in this um, model. Um, you can see far reaching sun coming in here. Um, midday, a little bit in the meeting room, um, kind of streaking light, um, thanks to tree um, shade, shading, um, 4 p.m not much at all thanks to the surrounding forested areas um so that really concluded the daylighting so it was great to get a sense of you know the critical times of the year and what we need to to do knowing that we're intending and we're holding shade treatments for a lot of these spaces so the meeting room for sure the um the staff workroom, teams, you know, all these office spaces, the study, they will all get their own sh um, shading treatments. It was nice. I think we can get away with not needing any of those treatments um, for the north facing windows. So adults and children's. So I think they should be okay as they are. Um, and um, we are also looking at window mullion types where we can incorporate a little bit of a, a, a pressure plate fin and that gives you a, a slight shading performance um, for the window systems that we'll use on this project. But generally, I think we'll mitigate with um, shading, with use of shades, both motorized and um, uh, manual. Yeah, the, the good news with this was that there weren't any real surprises, right? We knew that I mean, obviously we have windows, we're going to get sun coming in the building, which is what we want. Um, but there are going to be some times of the day that are more difficult than others. And so we know that we're going to need shades, as Dominic said, in the small rooms. We're going to want shades 
irrespective in the meeting room, just because we're going to want more control over that room, even, you know, forget about its orientation, just in general, we're going to want to be able to control light. The fact that it has an opening on the west side, um, that is a challenging exposure, but we will have shades along that wall. And so we can mitigate those times of day and we can um, talk about the, the shading options. And, you know, we can do blackout shades, we can do um, solar shading. Um, I don't know that we'll need blackout shades. So it may be just simply a single roll of solar shading. And then we can play around with the, the, um, the density of the perforations in the shades, so, which, you know, block more light, but also make it so it's harder to see out of. So we want to strike a balance with those roller shades to make sure that when they're down, you still can see through them to some degree, uh, but they're, they're managing the light. And that's something we'll work through with, um, with our lighting designer. One window that we have talked about in the past, even you had raised this um, a few meetings ago and in the last meeting you asked about it and we had kept it in wanting to see how the daylight analysis worked. And that was the, the window above the door in the meeting room at the, at the far end. Um, and if, Dominic, if you cycle through these, you know, we, we're always going to have the door there because we need the egress. And actually this, this is a good example. Um, I would say two thirds of the light that's coming in from that opening is coming through the door. You can see that the, the head of the door is right about where that first row starts. Um, and so the upper portion of that window in, in this view isn't doing a whole lot to us. If you keep cycling through, um, you know, half of that is the door. The other half is the window above. Um, keep going. There's one where it, it penetrates a little deeper, but in a lot of these, it's it's kind of a non-issue. There are a couple of times, here's one where it, it pushes in deeper. Again, about half of this is, the, is actually sun coming through the door at the lower half of that opening. So I think, you know, we, we would like to keep it open all the way up because I think it makes for a nicer, um, a nicer interior for the room and then figure out like with the rest of that room, how we're going to manage that for those couple of times. And I think it's during the equinox um, that, that it was an issue. Uh, if we did a, a bottom up shade mounted to the mullion above the door um, that pulls up, you know, the, the angle makes it a little bit of a challenge to get a roller shade at the head going down. Uh, but if we did a bottom up shade with an angled cut on it, we could mitigate that in for those few times a year when it's a problem. Um, I mean, alternatively, we can get rid of it, but we do like having that clear, um, you know, glazing all the way up in that space. I think it um, just makes that room feel more open to its surroundings. Um, and the the daylighting analysis suggested to us that it wasn't as much of a problem as we thought it could be. Yeah. I like it. Like what? The window. The window. Okay. I can see aesthetically why you like the window i think i think there's going to be a shade on that window all the time and it's going to be closed but um i can see why you like the window i had another bigger concern than when i heard dominic say uh op manually op or uh, power operated shades is that what you mm -hmm. said that's correct yep I try to avoid that as much as possible uh, the Just, manual or the no, power, power because of yeah, concerns of the motor breaking down and things like that, maintenance? Well, one, they're expensive as I'll get out based on my work at UMass, and they freaking things break constantly. Hmm. And then people don't understand how to use the buttons, and they're just a nuisance. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, typically our default is manual shades in any small room, like teen room, staff room, director's office, study room. Where we tend to do the motorized ones is where we have larger expanses of glass, like the meeting yep. room, you know, where, where it's a lot taller, it just takes more effort. But that's not to say we can't do, you know, chain driven manual shades in the meeting room. Yep. So if that's, if that's your preference, that's what we can provide there. Where, where that would be more of a challenge is the solution that I was describing before though, which mm -hmm. is that upper window above the door. That's a difficult shade to do as a manual shade. Yep. Mm -hmm. We know of bottom up shades that would handle this, that are motorized that would handle this. I, I'll need to confirm that whether they do that as yeah. um, so, manual, if, not yeah. motorizing. But if, but that, you know, if that's a sort of directive from you guys, then that might make some decisions for us. If what's a directive to go with a manual no, or go with yeah. no, it's all manual and no, yeah. have no motorized shades on the project. Well, I, pref I prefer no, right. I really. prefer no mo motorized. Okay. okay. I'm with Jeff. Sounds good. Um, Penny, you had a question? Not a question, just a comment about oh. aesthetics. Um, I think I would prefer that room without that tall panel of glass over the door, just as a counterpoint to what other people have said. Okay. Sounds good. How's that for, for clear direction? Hmm. I think so. So just so if if there were a vote, which there hasn't been, um, we have one vote for that window. I think two votes against that window. Um, and then. And then yeah, I haven't, the and then I haven't voted. So you would you would lose I, the window, I, right, Jeff? I'd lose the window. I like the I like the glass on on the corner. I like the way they dealt with that. The glass above the door doesn't do much for me. I would keep the glass in the door. Okay. Could you could you um, come up with an alternative here where it wasn't clear glass all the way to the ceiling? Maybe if you drew a horizontal line from the top of the um, angled glass on the right straight across and just had a straight across panel just above the door and ditched the very top. We could. I think this the challenge is more the the shade than the size or shape of the window because if mm -hmm. if the directive is no motorized shades then it means you've got a chain hanging down at, in front of the door which doesn't i, I think is going to be problematic um in terms of egress and you know people getting kind of tangled up in something that's hanging in front of an egress door i don't i don't know that we'd be able to manage a manual shade in that location irrespective of the size of that window. Matt, can I just ask a question on the on the uh, glass wall on the right hand side of this perspective? Mm -hmm. Where would you put a shade on that window? There's no place to put a, a box or you put it exposed or so what would your intentions be there. I mean, there are a couple of ways we could do it, but but one option would be that you have a ledge um, at the top of the door that supports bottom up shades for the clear story portion and top down shades. Uh, bottom. Below okay. That. Okay. But, but that those bottom up shades are predicated on being motor driven, and so. Yep. That we may need to rethink this this whole corner. I mean, we we can certainly get top down shades mounted at the head of the windows on the west side, 
it's the it's the rake angle that will be more of a challenge yeah right okay. it, it turns the corner so we'll, we'll we'll just have to study this a little more i mean it, it the the manually driven shades as i said may dictate some decisions about glazing you know we we may find that we can't turn the corner with the glass because there's no easy way to do a manual shade there and we can't i don't think we can leave it unshaded given its orientation yeah okay right so that will it's something we'll have to study further nice i um, to ask the question can we oh, go back sure. well yeah all yeah. right yep I'll, so, I'll go back. so if i'm going to show a movie in that room mm -hmm. um so we've shown movies in the basement of town hall a lot on that um have you ever seen our army surplus screen you have haven't you uh, um, oh, maybe you, not wait. dominic but but matt you've had to have seen it um our army surplus screen on a stand it weighs 5,000 yes, pounds. I dropped it yeah. on Andrea once. Um, so, um, uh, so anyway, we, we would have trouble having the room be dark enough, um, you know, with, again, with our projector that was a cast off from the local college. Um, so anyway, but if we're just going to have a giant mounted TV, we don't have to worry about that as much. Um, you know, as long as we can block out the light so it's not shining in anybody's eyes, people are going to be able to see the screen. Yeah, so the if it's That's a monitor, it's going to be brighter right. probably right. than the projection screen. The other thing is projection right. screens, they're... There's a pretty wide range of quality in projection right. screens, and the quality affects the 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 brightness of the image, the quality of the image. The one that you have is ancient, right? And so its technology yes. has, has changed. Yeah. Projectors are better. Projection screens are better. So I think right. you, you could get a projection screen that performs better than the one you have. Oh but, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, but but I think a, a video monitor, you know, a wall mounted monitor is going to be brighter right. um, and therefore require probably a little less daylight mitigation than maybe a projector and projection screen would. You know, these are just all of the different things like we want to be able to use that room, it, you know, and we want to be able to know that, you know, that we're going to be able to block the light out. Um, and and west light is is sort of the the most annoying um it is. Yes. light yeah 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 so i mean again we'll have to we'll have to weigh the decisions about right. um screen or or sorry shade material with the whatever technology we end up using in that room and that's something we can we'll get help from our consultants on that but okay we'll want to we'll want to pick a shade density you know the density of the weave um so that it's controlling enough of the light but hopefully not being black we don't want blackout shades if we can avoid it um and i think less and less we are finding that we need blackout shades based on improvements in technology Um, so we also met with our landscape architect and um, they've started I just wanted to show you that they're starting to progress the design um, this is by no means you know even close to finished but the the one thing I just wanted to kind of highlight here was that they're starting to articulate this pathway around um, the west side of the building I think there's still a lot of work to be done around um, what could be a really nice kind of condition here at the the notch of the building. Um, and uh, I also just wanted to mention that they this is um, to be an ADA access, right, all the way around the building. Um, we have a swale condition 
that is continuing uh, across the front of the building and then all the way down to Leverett Street. And there would be a culvert condition here with a, a kind of a crossing um, uh, condition that they're considering. Um, so again, progress is happening um, with, you know, there's um, a lot of coordination going on with civil and landscape. I just wanted to get this in front of you. Um, and uh, also mention we have a transformer pad now that is required and needs to have close proximity to an entry to a drive condition. So we're currently holding a location here um, adjacent to the um, bicycle racks um, and, and not kind of obscuring views to the building um, through the entry sequence. Um, and so yeah, landscape is progressing. We're, we're meeting regularly with them and, and civil as well. Um, kind of a segue about um, landscape and civil. We are, our biggest effort right now is in to prepare for the Conservation Commission um, uh, submission. So um, the NOI, we, um, the critical piece to that right now that, um, that um, Fuss and O'Neill are working on is the stormwater report. So they need that in hand as part of the submission. Um, and uh, moving ahead to the schedule, initially we were hoping for some time in September to, to make a formal submission with the Conservation Commission, but it may slip a little bit to October, um, depending on how quickly we can get some of this information together. Um, so, uh, there's that element I just wanted to bring up. Um, I've, we've obviously got some outstanding requests with you guys um, regarding um, the electrical engineer and um, uh, their request for tax ID from the town so that they can make a formal um, uh, request to Engrid. And, um, uh, and then, then a couple of other items that came up um, the plumbing engineer would like to kick off um, his design of the water systems for the building and is relying on a, on the well, on the proposed well, um, kind of that scope being defined. And that's, um, uh, in this case, that would be handled by the town to get a well contract and kind of start kicking that off. So I just wanted to bring that up. So I need a little bit more information. That was one of the emails you sent yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So, uh, so do you, so in the last site plan, yep. does it have a location of a well? Um, and do you want me to just go ahead and get the well installed? That's my understanding. So, okay. all right, and um, yeah. I will confirm that. So this was in verbally communicated in our last meeting, hence my request to you via email. I will... Right make sure that I get every um, piece of information that our plumbing engineer needs to you. But um, so I'll follow up and make sure I get an, a strategized item list. And so then I would, so let's just say I call, you know, uh, the local well installer or three to get prices, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would give them that site plan. Correct. And I would say, um, tell me how much it's going to cost to to drill a well right here and then i would have to um figure out if we need to have that permitted through the conservation commission um and then we would just go ahead and and install the well okay yep. all yeah, right that's yeah, kind it's... of fun yeah, yep. Dominic, why, why are we doing that outside of the construction package just out of curiosity that was my understanding of how it was set up from the plumbing engineer. I don't know, Matt, if you know any more about that. Um, it's I, it's current. I think it has to. It's just the the type of work, right? That we I, are not. I, I, mean, I wasn't part of that conversation. Mm. Uh, that was while I was away. But I would think that maybe it's because they need to know what the yield is from that well. Right? How 
how much that's water right. and how fast can we get out of that well? And that's not something they're going to know until they dig it, right? It's a it's sort of like geothermal test wells. You know, you got to know, you got to do a test well to know what what you're actually getting for yield out of that well. And they need that to be able to then make determinations about, you know, domestic water, but also, and I, I don't know that you wanted to get into this today, Dominic, but um, the whole question about irrigation also would sort of tie back to whatever the yield is from that well. That's right. That's fine. It'll probably be cheaper too. Don't you think mm -hmm. if we just do it on our own, then it, yeah, the, the cost, the cost of the well is still going to be the same. We still have to pay prevailing wage. Um, right. right. The whole nine yards. It's just, you won't right. pay up on it. Right. Right. It's, you know, I, it's on my list of things to do. I have a grant mm -hmm. application that's due today. So all I'm doing today is the grant application and this, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but then, uh, but Tuesday, I'll call well installer. Well, uh, the Penny here, you you do need to talk to the Conservation Commission on the Board of Health before you do those things. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll talk to Penny before I talk to anybody else, and then um, and you know, Board of Health is easy. Um, so. Well, I mean, they they will want confirmation of where the septic system will be before they say that's great. And so I think you have to um, do your perk test and right. confirm that your yeah. perk test is good before you cite the well. Okay. Well, I okay. And I'm working on scheduling that. So, okay. Um, I'm pushing on my structural engineer for you. Mary, and I think that's in my court, or at least my engineer's court. I just wanted them to review the structural. Um, I, the perk test and the board test, they're two different things. I'm sorry. I, I, right. Yeah, because right. that's yeah, outstanding the perk as test, well. We, the perk test we're going to do um, one day. And then yep. the other things, and we can do that sooner because it's outside of any buffer zones. Yeah. Um, so... Um, so we're, we're actually planning that, that is in the works to be scheduled for September 28th. And then we have a hearing with the conservation commission, um, on the 14th, um, and we can't do the soil borings and the test pits until the conservation commission permits it. And then there's a 10 day waiting period, but, um, and and civil has signed off on that plan. So and I sent everybody the proposal from OTO, and we're doing using OTO because Buston O'Neill doesn't do geotechnical testing, and we used OTO in 2010. Yep. Um, so um, uh, so somebody had asked me that question. Um, yep. So um, so uh, yes. Yeah, so it would be good to hear back from your structural engineer to make sure that that's. Yep what they're looking for I'll, I'll for that conservation them. commission hearing. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll do that. Um, yeah. I'll get, I'll follow up with my plumbing engineer just to make sure I've got kind of everything stipulated for okay. you as to okay. what they're hoping to achieve with, with the well contractor. And then lastly, our landscape architect is um, looking to do a site visit, a walkthrough and assess landscape elements as it relates to the proposed building location and and that's normally done by the surveyor staking out the building um footprint i've already emailed them perfect so, uh, excellent yeah. great so, uh, excellent yeah that i did okay. great and then the other thing was the um uh the neighboring well survey yeah. information that's on well. their list yep. yeah excellent that's on their list Great. Yeah. So looking at the schedule up on screen, nothing really has changed at this point. Um, I guess setting the next meeting date. That that was everything I had for you today. Um, if there were any questions. Dominic, just one question about the well. I yeah. just want to make sure you guys are going to give us what the anticipated flow rate would be. Right? Because we, we, we have to, I either have to 
specify how deep we're expecting the well or what it needs to produce for a yield. Yep. Right. We've got to give them some parameter to so that we're evaluating proposals based on a known scope of work. Yep. So what's the minimum expected? Let me, right. I'll get that information to you as quick as possible. I'll reach out to them today. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. and, and this is, and this is a, this is considered to be a public water supply. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, sorry, Penny, just while it's fresh in my mind, I just realized another question that just came up was water quality is a question my plumbing engineer would like to get a handle of as well. Um, as he designs the system, you know, what is, the, what is the expected water quality in and around your neighbours? You know, is it hard water, soft water, um, particulates, that kind of thing? So I don't know. Um, to get a jump start on the design, if we knew that the DOT across the way has a well and that, water cyst you know is it of a certain type that would be helpful for them to just get rolling um with their system design so i don't know marianne if if there's any um local knowledge of of what water quality is like um otherwise we'll wait for this uh um uh for the well yeah, and the okay. well contractor yep right I, I can I can ask the highway department or um, one of the houses next door. A lot of us do have sort of grit in our wells, depends. Mm -hmm. But um, and and yeah, the, no, like yeah, we have and nobody. Has, I don't think anybody has soft water. It's it's hard water around there. There's a lot of minerals. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then of course, you know, when we drill the well, we'll test the water. Yeah. And yeah. there's a there's a good chance that the well will have um so there's pretty widespread PFAS contamination. Um, and there's a good chance that there'll be PFAS and we'll have to have a a filter for that specifically. Yep. Okay. Um also the capacity obviously with the well. Matt raised a question about landscape irrigation. Now, it's something we haven't priced. It's always a question that comes up as it relates to um, project plantings and the fact that there is an establishment period and a requirement for water. Whether they're drought tolerant or not, there's usually at least a two-year uh, requirement to have some sort of regular water provided to plantings. Um, and I just kind of I plant the we'll seed, have... you know, right. is that something that the library or town can handle somehow? Is it something we roll into the project? I think if we were to have a full on irrigation system, that would be optimal, but it's expensive and would put a high demand on this well and doesn't make sense. I, I don't think our building water room could even facilitate the equipment required for that so all right off the table Agreed um, with but, you, but, do, but do keep in mind that it's it's an operating cost for you too it's not it's not simply going out there with a hose and you know i mean it's it requires a little more water than you might be thinking about so mm -hmm. I, I think it, it probably requires a conversation with our landscape architect Mm -hmm. so that you understand what it is because the, the cost can be not insignificant to have you know a water truck coming out there however often it needs to be to water plants to make sure that they're that you know getting through that two year one to two year establishment period it, it may not be as simple i i guess what i'm saying it may not be as simple as just hooking up a hose to a hose bib and you know kind of getting out there yourself and watering the plants but but let's let's talk to them about it. it it's yeah. it's been an issue on other projects where decision was made not to do sprinkler. And I'm I believe me, I'm not trying to force a sprinkler system on you guys. I think I'm totally with you. If we can avoid irrigation, I'm I'm totally for it. I just want to make sure you guys understand what is required to make sure that those plants get established. 
we've got some pretty experienced uh, gardeners um, okay. on this team okay. uh, who have pretty extensive, have done a lot of extensive landscaping work. Okay, um, good. Great. So, well, without um, an irrigation system. Right. Or water trucks coming up. So, right. uh, right. yeah. And, and we don't generally have, um, uh, we don't generally have water yield issues. Um, we, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a well that, it's 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 rare to hear of people having wells that don't have really good output. Mm -hmm. Um Got so it. yeah. So I mean I I could water at my house, which is two miles away, I could water and water and water and water. Um if there were ever a need to water. Um, but this year there certainly hasn't been. Um so and I would never I would never even worry about the well okay so good good great um marianne would you like to hear that's great to hear about the well would you like to hear at least the irrigation or the watering requirements for establishment of the selected species um um or current kind of uh i i i don't penny do you really think that's going to be a problem no. i mean i think we'll just all be up there we're going to be having a blast. We're going to be spraying each other with the hoses and nice, and you know. So, um, I we're I don't I don't anticipate that being an issue at all. Okay, so, great. Yeah, we're going to nice. be you know dancing in our tiptoes as we're out there. You know, nice. yeah. Um, following up, Penny. I'm sorry, I kind of um ignored your raised hand there after well, um, a well, bunch of questions. My question was about the irrigation system. And I think the mm -hmm. discussion among some of us, uh, which just was revealed that uh, we don't think we need an ir irrigation system. Okay, that's great. In fact, we're pretty, we're confident we don't need an irrigation system. Yep. Great. Um, that's everything, um, my uh, including the hot list at the end there. <laughs> For next meeting, I have um, Wednesday, September thirteenth at four p.m. So the the building committee meets Tuesday, meets meets Wednesday, September sixth at seven p.m. and we tell them all of this, and they actually are the the voting. Um, body and then and then for the design subcommittee i have wednesday september 13th at 4 p.m does that all make is that what everybody else has uh yeah i had i remember the time change to 4 p.m on right. the 13th yes and then i don't know why we're meeting on wednesday next week instead of tuesday but that's what i had on my so somebody okay. wasn't available Tuesday. So that's Wednesday, September 6th, you said? 6th, yes, okay. at 7. At, at 7 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, this is fun and exciting. <laughs> and We're getting there. Yeah. And it's also, it's a lot to think about yeah <laughs> so it's good good thank you all right everybody thank you all we'll see you i guess next next week next wednesday yeah. okay all right thanks great. so much okay. great thanks everybody all right thank you bye everybody thank you bye